Welcome to the Explore the Bible lesson for March the 14th, 2021. Uh, this is for the Grassy Valley Baptist Church, Acts chapter 2, verse 42, Sunday School class. And today we'll be looking at the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15. We won't cover the entire chapter. I'll summarize some of it. But before we begin, let's go to the Lord here in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so, so very much for the scriptures and for the teaching here where we learn that you are a forgiving and a loving God who will accept us and gladly receive us even after we've lived sinful lives. I just praise you for that, Lord, for your grace and for your mercy. And I pray, Lord, that we'll see the clear teaching in this uh, chapter 15 of the Gospel of Luke today. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, I've prepared a PowerPoint uh, presentation to make it a little bit easier, so I'm going to go to that now. In um, uh, the title slide here, we have the chapter 15 of the Gospel of Luke. Our primary lesson will come from chapters chapter 15, verses 20 through 32. But before we get to, to verse 20, I just want to summarize the first part of chapter 15. And uh, I'll read some of this and comment on it. So the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, starting at verse 1. This is the parable of the lost sheep. And I'm using the English Standard Version translation uh, for this lesson. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Folks, people from everywhere were drawing near to Jesus, and uh, they're described as tax collectors and sinners, and they drew near to him. The religious leaders, the Pharisees and the scribes, grumbled. They were aware that Jesus would uh, eat with the sinners, and this disturbed the religious leaders. But they they did uh, accurately see there that Jesus is is a friend of sinners. So Jesus told them this parable, uh, and it's it's about a lost sheep. Uh, he basically says. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me. For I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Jesus is most assuredly a friend of sinners, and he makes this point clear in this portion of the parable. He describes uh, a, a seeking for one lost sheep. Well, in the parable of the lost coin, which follows, it's Luke chapter 15, verse 8, Jesus continues uh, along this same theme. Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin and does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it, and when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So in this first and second parable, Jesus says there's joy in heaven or joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So there's the idea that sinners can repent. They will surely be welcomed back into his kingdom and into full fellowship with God. 
Well, the in these two parables, uh, those that were responsible for the lost sheep and the lost coins actually searched for them. And now we're going to see a story about a father who is waiting, actually, for his prodigal son to return. So Jesus begins to teach an additional parable here in verse 11 of Luke chapter 15. And he said, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country. And there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger. I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. The father had been longing for his son's return from the time the son left. Um, he uh, was extraordinarily anxious for his son's return. It's as if he had been keeping watch, longing for his wayward son to return. Okay. Yeah. And the son arrived. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father told his servants, Quick, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. And then bring the fattened calf and slaughter it. And let's celebrate with a feast because this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. This uh, most likely was the father's best robe. It probably belonged to the father, and it was a sign that he was welcome to return. The ring represented authority in the household, so when the ring was placed on his finger, he was restored to his former authority in sandals. Apparently, uh, slaves at that time didn't wear shoes or have shoes, but this young man was, was not going to be relegated to position of a slave. He's going to put sandals on his son's feet, and the young man's going to be restored to the full sonship. And then they are going to celebrate. A fattened calf will be slaughtered, and they're going to feast and celebrate. The father says, This son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found, so they began to celebrate. I can't imagine the demeanor of this young man prior to his departure. He had the gall to ask his father for his inheritance long before the father was actually uh, near death, 
And uh, he could have actually lost the entire inheritance by being so arrogant and uh, bold to ask for that. But the father was very, very wise and very gracious. And um, he knew a lot about his son. He, he knew that the best thing to do was to give him this. And uh, he did. He gave him the, his full share of the inheritance. And uh, the value of the father's love for the son and the, and the value of the son to the father is apparent. The material goods are not what's at stake here in this parable. It's the love of the father for the son and the son essentially coming to himself or coming to his senses so that he can return to full fellowship with his father who loves him. That's the key element of this story. I once shared this uh, passage here from the Gospel of Luke about the prodigal son with a, with a man who had uh, worked as a hit man. He had uh, assassinated people and uh, he had absolutely no idea that there was a, a parable like this anywhere. He asked me, where did you hear a story like that? And I remember saying, well, this is, this is in the Bible. And I got a Bible and marked it uh, for him. I bookmarked that passage and gave it to him and asked him to read it again. But he, he, did, he wanted me to tell him this parable many times. So I shared it with him, and, and he wanted a fuller understanding. I explained to him that it, it meant no matter what people have done, they can, through faith in Jesus Christ, through repentance from sin, they can return and be reconciled to God the Father. And he had no idea that forgiveness was available, that God would have anything to do with him. But uh, he meditated on this uh, parable. And uh, uh, sometime later, uh, about a month later, he let me know he had received Christ. And shortly after that, he was baptized. And he followed the Lord right up until he, he didn't have too much longer to live. He was a very sick man. But right, he followed the Lord faithfully right up until he departed this world. So I was so, so thankful to have that chance to share this good news with that man. Um, he believed this clear teaching that God would forgive him, and uh, he understood that he had to come through Jesus Christ. Uh, we talked at length about that, and he received Christ, and he is with the Lord now. I'm fully confident that he's with the Lord now, and I'll see him again eventually. Well, um, I don't know where you may be at this point in your life. Many of us uh, uh, have spent long times away from the Lord. I know I did for many, many years. I didn't, uh, uh, didn't believe in Christ. I didn't believe in the Bible. And uh, I knew I had heard about it. I knew had a little bit of knowledge, but not much but I was not really a genuine believer. But in 1998, I read one Gospel of John all the way through, and I met Jesus Christ. I became a genuine believer on January the 18th of 1998. And since that time, I've come to learn other passages here, like this parable of the prodigal son. And I had been a prodigal, and I was welcomed back uh, into the family of God when I received Jesus Christ as my Savior. I was fully reconciled and restored. I did not deserve it. I had no merit whatsoever, nothing to um, commend myself to the Lord, but He is gracious and He longs for us to return to Him. It's um, uh, in this passage when the Son came to Himself, that was a very important uh, turning point in His life. So no matter where you are, no matter what you've done, you can return to the Lord. It's through faith in Jesus Christ. He, Jesus Christ has lived a sinless life, an absolutely perfect life, and he did that for you. You and I could never live a sinless life. He also, uh, through his shed blood and his death on the cross, he also paid for all of our sin. He removed the penalty from us 
by paying that penalty in full himself. He died for us. So in uh, simple terms, he did for us what we could never have done in at least two counts. He lived the sinless life for us. A sinless life is required for entry into the kingdom of heaven. You must be holy, you must be righteous, and these are things we do not have naturally, but God will provide those for us as a free gift. We receive these by faith in Jesus Christ. He imputes to us his righteousness. On the other hand, the penalty must be paid in full for all the sins we've committed, the ones we've already committed in the past, the ones we may commit today, and the ones between now and the time we physically die that we'll commit. All of our sins must be paid for, and Jesus' shed blood, his death on the cross, was payment in full for our sins. Again, we receive this by faith in Jesus Christ. And this parable was taught by Jesus himself. His intent was to let sinners know there is forgiveness available. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, his blood was absolutely sufficient to pay the penalty for your sins and his sinless life, his life of sinless uh, perfection, his, his righteousness is a free gift. He's providing it for you and I. So I believed him on that day in January of 1998, and since that time I have been forgiven. I have been declared uh, righteous in God's eyes, but it was all through faith in Jesus Christ. So the invitation stands, the offer stands for all people everywhere. He wants everyone to know what kind of reception they will receive if they repent, if they humble themselves, if they put their faith in Jesus Christ, he will receive you. So I'm um, presenting this again with the sincere desire that everyone that hears this will know Jesus as Savior, as Savior. Let him be your sin bearer. Let him pay the penalty for your sins and let him provide you with the righteousness that you could never attain on your own. It's an amazing, it's, it's one of those things that sounds too good to be true, but the scripture plainly tells us that that's precisely what God has done for us. He is offering his righteousness and he's offering a complete pardon and he offers all of these and much, much more to us. All the riches of Christ are available to whosoever will receive him. And you receive him by faith. So... The uh, father told his servants, quick, bring out that best robe, put it on him, and uh, put the ring on his finger. The son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they actually really, they began to celebrate. Well, the father had a, an older son. And um, the son was out in the field and he heard the music and the dancing. So this older son summoned one of the servants, questioning what these things uh, mean. One of the servants explained, your brother's here, he told him, and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf uh, because he has his, has his son back safe and sound. Um, this is in, incomprehensible for, uh, for the older son to, to deal with. The... Uh, there's going to be quite an exchange here as we go. The, the older son became angry. He didn't want to go in. So his father came out and, and pleaded with him. But this older son replied to the father, Look, I've been slaving many years for you, and I've never disobeyed your orders. And yet you never gave me a goat so that I could celebrate with my friends. But... When this son of yours came, he ha who has devoured your assets with prostitutes, you slaughtered the fattened calf for him. Why did this older son get so angry 
about the celebration over his younger brother's return. After all, this younger brother had squandered his inheritance and the older brother accuses him of immorality, like being with the prostitutes. Well, God, we know, wants us to be faithful to what he's called us to do and, and not to compare ourselves to others. So there's, there's, um, it's not a good opportunity here for the older son to behave in this manner. Uh, the real struggle now for this older brother in this passage, he's struggling with jealousy over all the attention that his younger brother was receiving, and he has sort of a self-righteous anger. He's, he's prideful. He feels perhaps that he should be rewarded for being faithful and obedient uh, rather than uh, living like his brother who was reckless and, and defiant. The father was, was interested in character development, and I would imagine this younger brother was kind of a spoiled brat prior to leaving the home. Uh, he sure looks like it the way he behaved. Um, but when he returned, he was a changed man. He had hit rock bottom out there in a, in a hard world, almost starved to death. He lost everything, and he was really humbled, genuinely humbled. And to return home and ask his father uh, just to simply give him a job, no longer to acknowledge him as a son, that, that's, that's a very humbling thing. Well, this is the, the, this is the type of son that one would be pleased to have when he returns. He's going to be a, a pleasure to live with. He's humble. He knows there is true joy in being rightly related to his father and being in his father's home, being uh, on the father's farm there and, and being part of the family and able to work again and be productive. And even though he, he took a, a journey out into the world where he fell, uh, the father has gladly welcomed him back because the father loves the son. The father wants the son to return. The the Father, uh, God the Father, longs for each and every person who has been out in the world for some time to return. He's waiting. He's um, glad to receive us when we return, when we eventually come to our senses, as this young man did. He will welcome us on our return. We come through faith in Jesus Christ. And uh, oftentimes you, you may be tempted to feel that, well, I've done too much. There's, there's no way I could be forgiven. I've done too much. Um, I have talked to many, many people over the years who have done a lot of things. And I myself have done a lot of things that I, I really, I'm just amazed that God can and will forgive me. He will forgive murderers. He will forgive adulterers. He will forgive anyone who will humble themselves and come to Jesus Christ. They'll, they're willing to repent. They're willing to receive the righteousness of Christ as a free gift. God the Father will gladly receive those who receive Jesus Christ. It's the way that he himself has put into place for us. So the older brother here, is struggling with that. It doesn't quite seem fair to him, but that's the, uh, the way that it is. In, uh, in God's economy, he's provided us a savior and no one's work, no one merits salvation in and of themselves. So God has provided one savior for all of us. And uh, those of us who are willing to receive Christ Jesus by faith will be forgiven. So. Let me go to the next slide here and see if I can uh, get over there. All right. And let's see. Let's go that again. And here, here. Okay, there we go. <laughs> All right, I'm learning how to do this PowerPoint. Son, he said to him, you are always with me. This is the father speaking to the older son. And he says, everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and rejoice because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. 
he was lost and is found. You know, this, this father was very wise. He didn't give in to the older son's protests. Instead, he simply explained to the older son why he chose to celebrate the, uh, the younger son's return. Now, the father reached out with compassion to this uh, fairly wild and loose living young prodigal son. The son, yes, he had left home and yes, he had squandered his resources, but he had returned. And um, the, the father wanted the young man to return home, so he was thankful for, for that. And he didn't choose to dwell on the fact that the resources were gone or that he had made some bad choices in the past. He received his son back. Now, um, he was also compassionate with the older son, even though the older son had stayed home. And at this moment, uh, he's, he's not happy with his younger brother. He's not happy about the situation in general. But the father loves him as well. Um, the hard-hearted prodigal and the prideful older son uh, are both sons, and the father loves them both. Well, um, the father chose to receive the younger son back, and uh, he wants us, God the Father wants us to rejoice with people who've chosen to accept Jesus Christ by faith. He wants all of us who have received Christ to rejoice when someone else receives Christ. We're not to look at their past and um, criticize or, or, or judge them like this older son has done. We should be rejoicing at the fact that someone has returned to Christ Jesus in, in faith and given their life to God. We should not begrudge others coming to faith in Christ. Uh, God desires for us to celebrate when someone chooses to, to follow him. So, now reflect, let's see, let me go down here just a little bit more here. And there's a question here to consider. I don't know where you may be at this point in your life, but will you return to your heavenly Father? Examine your life right now and see, is this where you really should be? I ask people all the time in the inner city, are you where you're supposed to be? That's kind of a shocking question, uh, but it does provoke thought. I want to cause people to think about where they are. Uh, I'm not speaking so much in your phys about the physical location, but I'm speaking about their relationship with the Lord. Are you where you need to be with Almighty God? Are you where you need to be with the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you led by the Holy Spirit? Does the Holy Spirit guide your words, guide your thoughts and your actions? Does, 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 does Jesus Christ mean everything to you? Do you love him? Do you honor him with your behavior and obedience? If there's anything that comes between you and the Lord Jesus Christ, it is not worth it. Let it go. Turn it loose. Repent of it. If there's anyone or anything in this world that hinders you from a, a right relationship with God, it is not worth it. Think carefully about that and you'll see uh, there's a man in the Old Testament named Esau. He uh, despised the inheritance that was rightfully his. He traded this, his inheritance for a bowl of uh, stew from his brother, brother Jacob. Jacob was pretty, uh, pretty conniving there, pretty wily, but, but the, the Esau, the older brother, simply despised. He, he did not value the inheritance that was rightfully his as the older son. Well, the inheritance that God has for people is infinitely valuable. But if we despise it, if we don't value it, we may not receive it. So don't let that uh, happen to you. If you will return to God, come so now. Come through faith in Jesus Christ. Receive the righteousness that he wants to bestow upon you. Receive the gift of forgiveness. And you will forever be thankful that you did. I have a, a little picture here, just uh, the joy of a son returning to his father. When we return, 
he, God the Father, will gladly welcome you. So I want to thank you for, for being with me here during this. And uh, if you have any comments or questions, why, uh, let me see them on the Facebook there. And I'll put this up on YouTube and on Facebook. And I just want to ask you now to, to join me here as we close out in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so, so much that you're merciful and gracious and you're willing to forgive us. Lord, it's hard really to believe sometimes that we can be forgiven for all the things we've done. And yet, it's your desire for us to return and be reconciled. Help us to come uh, boldly and, and quickly. Help us to come and uh, receive the forgiveness that you offer in Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that people that watch this uh, message will open their Bibles. They'll get time alone with, with you and um, their relationship will be fully restored with you, Father, through faith in Jesus Christ. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you all for being with me and I uh, invite you to come back next week. I'll have another lesson up. God bless you. Bye-bye.